Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're getting lots of people coming in here right away. Let's just get ourselves started. Welcome to everybody today. I appreciate this. How much nicer is it, uh, can I just say, to, to have a, uh, a presentation when I have actually given everybody the access to like the actual room? Um, when we did this last week, which you most of you probably got the email for, um, I had two people show up and I was like, oh, I'm like, this is so sad. And today, here we go. We have uh, already 19 people in the room. So thank you all so very much, um, especially after a, for those of you in Canada, um, after such a great long weekend, I hope you got your fill of uh, turkey and friends and wine and all of the wonderful things that make us uh, just absolutely grateful. Grateful to be here, grateful to, to have this experience, um, grateful to, to have this entire conversation, um, which actually really ties in nicely to emotional intelligence and the sales conversation. Because it is that much nicer to connect with our clients when we understand where they're coming from. We'll talk a little bit about the, the layers of emotional intelligence and everything, but for the most part, uh, what I really want to see, oops, it looks like somebody is, um, is typing in some pretty little arrows. Let's just get that. Um, oh, thank you to whoever deleted that already. Um, what we're ultimately going to do is we're going to go through this. Now, the chat is open. Feel free to, to chat, chime along, have the conversations all the way through. Um, I'm glad to see so many of you have had your, your phones and your uh, everything muted as well as your computers turned off. So let's get started here uh, as we go forward on this. So welcome to Emotional Intelligence. I want to introduce you, for those of you that aren't familiar with who KO Advantage Group is, most of you should be, but I will give you a quick reminder. We are one of the fastest growing sales training schools across Canada, um, and we have students in the U.S. as well as Canada. So we are going to be having our two-year two year anniversary at the end of uh, next month, which is super phenomenal. We have grown incredibly fast. Uh, we have um, instructors that are here to, to help you grow your business. We are focused on the B2B high value services. So ultimately what that means is if you're trying to sell a product or a service that doesn't have a tangible, something that can't be touched, such as engineers, business consultants, instructors, uh, marketing agencies, something else like that, and you're wanting to position yourself in that mid to high to premium pricing tier, this is what we teach you. We teach you the entire sales process in order to get from start to finish. And it originally started off with me giving my experience and then developing it. But over time, we've become really good curators of content. We're doing the research, we're finding out the conversations, we're building that all the way through. So my sales background, um, when I, before I got started with Chaos Advantage Group, uh, I actually worked in sales. I decided that I wanted to be a finance major in university, and I love spreadsheets and I love numbers. I love that because when you follow the process, right, with math, you know, you know exactly whether you got the answer right or wrong every single time it made sense. And I loved that. And when I was looking for new careers, I really wanted to work in a company that would allow me to be a business analyst. I wanted to go ahead and do spreadsheets all day long. And only when I was applying with different jobs, a woman came up to me and she says, oh, no, no, no. She goes, you deserve to be a salesperson. And I thought this was like so terrible. I'm like, why would this woman go ahead and insult me like this? Why would she go ahead and, and tell me that I'm a salesperson? I mean, salesperson got to have to be some of the lowest people in the world, right? And we all have these misconceptions of who sales are, right? We think of the greasy used car salesman, the one that would say absolutely anything they can possibly do in order to get the deal done. And so she's like, no, no, it's not like that, actually. She's like, sales is probably one of the best careers you could ever have. She's like, it is of the service of helping others. And when I started to do a little bit more research on what sales actually is, you know, the best salespeople were those that were honest and open and transparent. The best salespeople were the ones that were genuinely interested in helping. And the best salespeople were the ones that wore their hearts on their sleeve. 
And they said, I know I can help you. And when I understood that, all of a sudden everything was like magic. I, I followed the Xerox process. I ended up becoming sales rep of the year. I ended up continuing to develop that process, you know, working for other companies like Clarion Medical, American Express, Purolator, all the way through. And, and eventually I got to a point where I needed to share this message with so many more people. But at the end of the day, when you learn a sales process, right, sales is not about ambiguousness. Sales is about actually knowing where you are and where the conversation is and being intentional about what the next steps are. And when you understand that, everything becomes a lot easier. So this is me today. I am uh, LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow. I am Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. I am a three-time author and there's my book, uh, Sell More Faster. If you haven't received a copy of this um, or you're wanting to, to get a free ebook, um, let, I'll give you an information um, below at the end of this webinar to get the free ebook version of the, the book. And if you want to order it, I'll also give you an order link because some people like me, I love to actually hold and feel that book. I'll even personally sign it for you. I am Startup Canada's uh, Woman Entrepreneur of the year, year, and I am um, a picture taker with Oprah, we'll call it. <laughs> All right. But I want to talk a little bit about, because and there's so many of us that struggle in this sales conversation. And I want you to even understand that people like me, right? Who, I, I, a lot of people will tell me, yes, Kim, like, you know, it's easy for you. You are a, you're a natural born salesperson. No, I struggled to sell just as much as so many of you are on the line today. It started off when I was working with Xerox and I, I didn't understand what sales was. And I remember being my very first year at Xerox, my very first few days actually. And they really very much believed in the school of hard knocks, right? It, here's your list, go out and call them, go out and get meetings. And for three days, three days, I stared at this list and I would go on the websites of these companies and I would like, you know, try to figure out what more I could find out and like research and look for newspaper articles and look for all sorts of different things where I was ultimately trying to find out how can I help these people sell. And I started, I cried. I cried because I was so nervous. I didn't know what to say. And I didn't know. And it was like, I was looking on every single website for somebody to have like in flashing bright lights saying, we are looking for a copier right now. So that then I would know I would have to call them. But we know the reality is no matter what your service is, number one, you should truly believe that your service is there to help people. But number two, you're never going to see a flashing banner ad on any website saying, we are looking for this service. We are looking for this type of company to help us through this problem. You're never going to find that. And yet I was looking for this, this opportunity and I would sit there and I would cry. And finally on the third day, one of my colleagues came up to me and he picked up the phone and he dialed the numbers and he says, it's for you. And I cringed. And all of a sudden I was forced to have a conversation with somebody and it became easier and it became easier. And the more times I did it, the easier it became. That very first moment was so hard. Now we're going to fast forward that because eventually I got over my nervousness. I got over that anxiety of what it was like to make the phone call. But then I got into a position where I started my own company, hence KO Sales U. And when I started the company, I all of a sudden was struggling to sell again because selling a product for another company seems like it's so much easier than selling your own product. Now that I was creating a sales training, now that I was helping individuals, I started to take rejection a lot personally. And I would start to explain to people why they needed to buy this service, why they needed to have sales training. And we'll talk about this a little bit later when we, as we go through in the emotional intelligence piece. But the reason why I wasn't connecting with anybody was because I wasn't tapping into what they were feeling. I was trying to talk to them logically about how sales training would ultimately help them. And I was missing out on the big piece of this all the way through, right? Thank you, Jocelyn. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you guys. You, all, you guys have the chat open. So please, I love knowing that there's other people on the other side here. And so, you know, by, by understanding that I was missing out on this piece on why somebody even wanted to buy, why they needed the service besides just the logical reasons, 
I was disconnecting from the conversation. I was holding everyone at arm's reach and saying, this is what I have to present to you. Do you need it? Do you want it? Of course you do. And then they would sit there and be like, well, I don't know. We'll think about it. And this became hard because as I would have one conversation that wouldn't lead to anything, I started to de develop more of that self-doubt. Am I really meant to this? Is, is this really a viable company? Is this something? And you could hear the self-doubt by desperate circle start to go down and down and down until finally I shook it. And I realized what I was ultimately missing all the way through. So as we go through this, I want you to, number one, understand that there is no such thing as a born salesperson. I was in Lethbridge last week and I was chatting with a woman and she goes, Kim, it's easy for you, right? You're, you're meant to do sales. She's like, that is exactly who you are. And I love telling the story about how when I was pregnant, my husband and I were finding out the, the sex of our baby. And at the 20 week ultrasound appointment, you know, the ultrasound technician would go ahead and scan my belly and she's waiting to find out, you know, is this going to be a little baby boy or a little baby girl? And my husband and I are all excited. And as we're holding hands to find out, you know, which one of us is right, right? Which one of us won the bet on whether it's a baby boy or a baby girl? At no point in time would we ever hope and expect this, the ultrasound technician to say, listen, you're not going to have a baby boy or a baby girl. You're going to have a salesperson. And you, we, we, you, like, I mean, to think about this, I mean, we're not born as salespeople. Sales is something that we learn the same way that somebody is not born to be a musician. Somebody is not born to be a mathematician. Somebody is not born to be any of that. There might be certain qualities that might find themselves to be a little bit better on that. But at the end of the day, everyone could be a salesperson because it is a skill. It is a skill we learn. Now, here's the other thing, and we don't cover it today, in today's class, but introverts are actually some of the best salespeople. So if you find yourself skewing a little bit more towards the introverted side, or even in that it's called the ambivert and right in the middle side of it, you're actually considered to be some of the best salespeople because it all plays into emotional intelligence. We need to embrace the things that we are really good at, not reject it and try to be somebody completely different. So one of the easiest ways that we can invite emotional intelligence and invite the emotional conversation into our sales conversations is by changing the way we position certain questions. When we call on somebody or we sit down with somebody, oftentimes we are trained to say, how are you doing today? Right? How are you doing today? And, and I'm guilty of this as well. I mean, I went went ahead and I placed a phone call to somebody this morning. And I was like, oh, how was your weekend? How was it? How was it? You know, where when we change the language ever so slightly to instead of how are you doing, doing is the act of doing something. Right now I am doing, I'm typing. Right now I'm watching this webinar. Right now I'm thinking about all the other things I have on my schedule left for today. When we invite the conversation to be how are you feeling, it changes the dynamic of how the conversation ultimately invites ourselves. And when we ask somebody, how are you feeling today? There is psychological research that the person does this like instantaneous check on themselves. Now they may answer the exact same way as how you were doing. I'm doing fine. How are you feeling today? I am feeling fine. But ultimately what they are doing is by changing the order of these words and inviting certain other words, I am feeling. It opens them up to be much more positive and optimistic. And people that are positive and opt optimistic are more likely to be receptive to new information and new conversations. So if nothing else from today, you take, I want you to start practicing and getting into the habit of changing your opening from how are you doing to how are you feeling? The moment we start to invite that conversation, it changes the way we gather information. It changes the way we approach a conversation and ultimately helps us to become more connected with those that are around us. How many, for you, those of you that are open to the chat, how many of this does this make sense? Tell me that you're like, I like it, I don't like it, I don't get it. You know, I wanna hear what you guys are ultimately feeling as we're going through this. 
So part of understanding a little bit more about how we feel in these conversations, thank you, Sergey. this makes sense, right? Um, part of understanding how we feel in these conversations is number one, only spending time with those that are our ideal clients. Because we can all agree that if you're not spending time with people you like, people that you want to work with, it makes everything feel a lot more difficult. It makes things feel challenging all the way through. And the last place we ever want to be is feeling like the people that we're working with is that we are not enjoying this conversation. Um, is it, so Steph asks, is it too personal if the person you're speaking with is unfamiliar with you? Absolutely not, Steph, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking somebody, how are you feeling today? Now, remember what we don't touch on in today's um, conversation, but we will in a future webinar, is the, the impacts of tonality into the conversation. Tone takes a big piece of this. And when we ask somebody in a tone that says, how are you feeling today? Versus how are you feeling today? Those actually come across as two completely separate conversations to the person that is receiving that question. Um, uh, Linda says it feels too personal from someone born and raised in Norway. I mean, and that's, that might be the case, but depending if you are wanting to sell to people, if your clients are where they are, which is in Canada, in the U S maybe in some of the other places, uh, you know, you want to be able, and Jocelyn says this starts to make her feel vulnerable. And that is a good thing to be because remember we buy from those we like and we trust and we trust those that are open to us. We trust those that we believe are already open and honest and transparent with us. Tra vulnerability is hard. It is hard. But those that can embrace it and say, this is who I am, you are going to find that you are going to be connected with people far more. So number one, what you want to do is you want to understand that you're only going to start spending time with your ideal clients. If you haven't done a buyer persona, also known as a customer avatar, an ideal uh, client, uh, what's it called? An ICA, an ideal uh, customer something or other, I can't remember. But at the end of the day, what this ultimately is, is can you articulate who your ideal client is. Can you tell me this is the person I'm looking for? This is the company I'm looking for. This is different than those that have created a ideal buyer, a target market, or an, a customer avatar in the marketing sense. Because oftentimes in the marketing sense, we are very vague and we are still very broad. I am looking for women that are 35 to 40 years old who are single income household owners that ultimately want to find financial freedom through, you know, both a job as well as a individual income, something or other, right? Bah, 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 bah. right? And we, we have broadened this out. We have created a, a, an ocean net that we are ultimately wanting to cast. Whereas in the sales aspect, we want to continue to drive that out down so that we can articulate who that person is. Can you tell me that this is a person that I would want to spend time with? Part of this is understanding what values do you share. Going back to the emotional intelligence piece, we have to understand who we are first and foremost before we impact the changes of others. So what do you value in a conversation? What, do, what are the things that you want to ensure that you are expressing all the way through? In my company and for myself, open honesty and transparency are some of the biggest values that we have. I cannot work with you unless I know what I am facing, right? And in return, I expect the exact, you should expect the same from me. I will be open and honest and transparent with you. I will tell you if something is not working or if it is. And so those are things that I ultimately look at. Now, here's the thing is if those are my values and those are the values that I want to share with somebody, and I find that they aren't being open and honest and transparent, I find out that they aren't giving me all the information. How do I help them? You know, if, if I don't know what I'm facing, how can I help them get to that level? And so for me, that becomes a big deal breaker. Think of this as like romantic relationships. What are your deal breakers? Would you work with somebody who is going to be dishonest with you or deceitful or not give you all the information? Is that somebody that you would eventually marry? And if that isn't, then choose to hold yourself at a higher standard in your own sales conversations as well. 
The other thing is, is you have to understand what fears or goals do they have. Now, this really drives into that emotional intelligence piece because we're not just talking about who they are or what their challenges are, or, you know, what's, what's the problem that they're facing, but what are they fearful of? Fear is an emotion, and in most cases, it's an irrational emotion, but it is still one of the emotions that will make us take action or prevent us from taking action. So what is your client fearful of? Now, they may be able to articulate this, but part of this is standing in their shoes and asking yourself, if I was them, what would be the thing that would cause me to not take action? What are the things that I'm most scared of, right? And, and here's the reality. With most businesses, what we're most scared of is going bankrupt. We're scared of being like completely destitute. We're scared of like letting down others. We're scared of investing in the, in the expect, in the expectation that the investment does not work out. And if it doesn't work out, how will that impact me further? Right now I've spent all this money. Now I've created, you know, poor morale with my company. Now I have not allowed people to see me as the leader that I am. I have to go out and find another job. And da, 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 da. These are fears. Right? On the goal side of this, where do you want to ultimately get to, right? Now, the other side of it is that if we are all one paycheck away from being bankrupt and destitute, we are also one paycheck away from having every single dream happen. We're one paycheck away from having one client, one client away from having, you know, our name and lights across the country, having interviews with all sorts of different people, right? Being recognized as a thought leader, you know, being able to become one of Canada's 50 top employees. Lawyers, da, 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 da. There's all these different goals that we have. And what would that allow me to be, right? Now I have, I have allowed myself to create a legacy, right? I have people that are following me. I have empowered even more people. I've created financial abundance for those that are surrounding me. And when we understand what the fears and what the goals are, what are the emotions tied to each one of those, we can then go ahead and fish where there are fish. Understand who your ideal buyer is, put yourself in those rooms, and then that ultimately becomes where you are. And it is okay to say no. It is okay to work with somebody who really wants to work with you, but they're not an ideal fit. Because remember, you need to feel excited about this interaction every single day that you work with them. You want to know that this person is going to stand on a mountaintop and sing your praises when your service is done all the way through. And thank you for those of you in the chat here all the way through. Um, Vinny asks, can emotional intelligence be learned and what can you do to build that skill? So yes, emotional intelligence can be learned. Yes, you can continuously build it. And in KO Sales U, we actually dedicate a whole module specifically to emotional intelligence and the role that storytelling takes in the, in the sales conversation. There's a few things that you can do. Um, number one, if you missed the last slide, it was how are you feeling? But number two, start with where you are right now. Before we start talking about how emotional intelligence can affect others, and ultimately that is where we want to get to, we have to, be uh, we have to recognize the emotions that we go through in the own conversation. Ali asks, how about if price is the concern or fear in the customers we are dealing with? Now, let's be honest here. Price is never the concern. People will always justify a price, right? You know, one of the things, one of the quotes I'll say in lead qualification in um, when we're in KO sales, you in module five is that budget will tell you what you can't afford, but it won't stop you from buying it. Price is not the concern. Oftentimes what the concern is, is that uh, we are not understanding the value and we're not seeing that if I'm going to spend this dollar how am I going to make back that dollar more than what I put on, right? Ultimately, nobody is going to spend a dollar if they think they're only going to get a dollar or a dollar five back. People will spend a dollar if they think they're going to get two or four or ten dollars back after a significant period of time. And if the fear is that I'm going to invest this money and not get that money back, that is something completely separate that you need to address besides the price because price is just a number. And as long as, so, I mean, if I could tell you, listen, you guys, you're going to spend $10,000 with me, right? Many of you are going to, oh, I don't want to spend $10,000. But if I say, listen, you're going to spend $10,000 with me. And within 90 days, you are going to get $50,000 back, you know, and guaranteed, you know, many more of you are going to be like, okay, 
if she's going to guarantee me some type of result, I'm just going to get the money, right? I am going to do whatever I can in order to get that, right? I mean, you know, people are spending a lot of t uh, money on lotto tickets, not because they honestly believe that they're going to lose the money, right? Rationally, we know that that's the case. But every single person that buys a lotto ticket irrationally believes that they're holding on to the winning ticket. They believe that this is the one that is going to win me something. And so it's not about the money. It is about what we believe this investment is going to do for us. We'll talk about that another day. But at the end of the time, um, when we go ahead and we sell to everybody, we are ultimately selling to nobody. If you say that your product or service is good for all of these different, well, I could sell my product and service for to companies that are as low as $100,000 to as high as $100 million. And we will work with companies that have anywhere between one to 100,000 employees. Like, your message is getting completely lost because here's the reality is that somebody who has a fear at a million dollar organization is different than someone who has a fear at a $10 million organization at a million dollars. Everything can be taken away like that at $10 million. It may still be a bit of a fear, but oftentimes some of the other fears will be, well, what if my business shrank to, um, by half, right? What if this happened or what if this happened? And ultimately what that is, is a little bit different. We also are going after bigger conversations. We're going after bigger goals, right? Um, I was watching a documentary over the weekend and they were talking about the difference between when you started to get into higher income brackets, right? Why billionaires existed. And they said, because once you get to a hundred million dollars to invest that amount of money and make $10 million is really easy to, to be at a hundred thousand dollars and to try to invest $10,000 becomes a little bit more difficult, even though fractionally it's the same. So we want to make sure that we are understanding where our clients are and being in the positions where they will ultimately be on. Because the other thing to understand is depending on who your ideal buyer is, every buyer is going to go on a unique journey. If you are a company that is selling to small companies, right? Companies of let's say uh, 25 people or less, that person may or may not either be going through faster decision making or a much slower decision making process than a company that is at a, a size of a thousand people. At a thousand people, there's probably bureaucracy, there's red tape, there's people we have to run these conversations by. And we have to understand where is our buyer? through this process. When I worked for Xerox, one of the biggest challenges we faced was we had a 12 step sales process. And we had to update this in our CRM on a daily basis so that our management team knew what the actions were happening so that they knew how to predict cash flow as it was coming through. If they know, knew that we were moving sales cycles forward, they knew on approximately how much we could possibly bring in. And the struggle with this um, concept as a 12 step sales process was that as a salesperson, we felt very arbitrary about where we were throughout a sales process. We didn't know where we were. And so ultimately it became very confusing for us. When we, when, when we create a KO Advantage group in the KO Sales U program, what we wanted to know is where is your buyer? Where are they through the process? And then to be sure that you are with them not ahead of them. Because this is where some of the biggest sales cycles will get stalled, is that we will present information to our client without asking ourselves, well, how did that make you feel? How do you feel about this conversation? How do you feel about the interaction we're on so far? But rather, here's a bunch of information. If you feel good, I will be waiting for you at the end. I will have a proposal waiting for you, or I will already have the proposal delivered to you. Let me know when you feel ready to move forward. Nobody wants to be with somebody who is going to throw, rush them through a process that they're not ready for. So you want to make sure you know where your buyer is so that you can create the right quality of conversations and relationships with them. Because the other thing is that relationships take time. Now, I do not want you to think that relationships take a large quantity of time. On the contrary, relationships take quality time. And we can think about this even when we think back to the people that have impacted our lives the most. We will find ourselves in positions where we may have known somebody for years. And can you even remember their name? 
right? I'm one of the, I'm a, like, when I think about people that I went to high school with, I'm probably, maybe I'm one of the few, but I'm like, I can't remember like more than half of the people I went to high school with. There's people out there that like can remember everybody. And I can't, I can't remember conversations. I can't remember names. I can't like, I'm just like, you know, cause I didn't really have a lot of quality relationships in high school. Yet I remember certain people, how they made me feel, how they impacted me right? Even people that I met like one brief time, I would be sitting at an airport having a deep conversation with somebody. And I will remember that person because there was quality involved in that conversation. If you want to develop a great relationship with your clients, ultimately helping you to achieve more, be open and vulnerable and be willing to be embracing a quality conversation. How much deeper can you get with your clients? And there is a fine balance between being too open and honest and transparent. Like your, your clients don't need to know everything about you, but they need to know that you understand their fears. They need to know that you understand how much more we can achieve together. Because when we are having those deeper conversations, everything becomes so much easier. And the idea behind this is to understand where your clients are on the destination versus transportation conversation. So we, we touch on this in various places throughout KO Sales U. Um, and really at the end of it, this, this becomes even more prevalent when we talk about the proposal. But before we get to the proposal, we have to know how someone will feel before we get there. What will they feel after we are done with them? And when we focus on where, where this is, right, think about, you know, an airline, whether this is uh, Air Canada Vacations, WestJet Vacations, Delta Vacations, any of those other airlines, they always love to focus you on the place that you do not want to be, whether that is happening right now or they foreshadow that it will be coming. You know, it might not be so bad wherever you are in the middle of October. You're like, oh, it's a beautiful fall day. But what they'll focus you on is that winter is coming. Dun, dun, dun. Winter is going to be here and it is going to be cold and it is going to be snow apocalypse and it is going to be the worst winter of the year. And they will show some person in a giant parka with ice crystals on their eyelashes and you can see their breath coming out. Like it is the most miserable time that it can ever possibly be. And in the very next scene, they will show you the juxtaposition of that a beach in Cancun. <sighs> because Cancun in the middle of July, no matter where you are, unless maybe you're in Calgary during Stampede, you're like, I just need to get anywhere else but here. Anywhere else, in, like Cancun in July is not quite, quite the same. You're gonna get to 31 degree weather, or if you're in the, in the States, right? You're at you know 90 degrees, right? You're like, oh, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. But it's not gonna make much of a difference if where you're leaving is also 90 degrees or 30 degrees. Like at the end of the day, you're like, oh, this is, like, is not you know, what we actually wanna see. And so where we want to get to is you know, at that beach. The beach is beautiful white sands, ocean breeze, you know, it's stunning. And for those of you that haven't heard the destination transportation, when you're talking to one of those airlines, what are they ultimately trying to sell you? And I wanna see you guys put these in the chats, right? Um, for those of you that have, I'm gonna give you a second to answer here in a second. But for those of you that haven't, when Delta or WestJet Vacations or Air Canada Vacations is selling you, you know, to the beach, what are they ultimately trying to sell you? You know, they're focusing you, number one, on how terrible it is in the middle of winter, and number two, this wonderful beach, and how beautiful it is, and how the, the ocean smells when it is breezing through, right? Margarita has heard this one before, I can tell that one. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, I have a, oftentimes a lot of people tell me, oh, they're trying to sell you an experience, they're trying to sell you bliss, they're trying to sell you, you know, um, a vacation, all this other, and it's like, no, it's not, like, none of that is right. They're selling you a seat, right? Um, yes, Vinny's got it. Margarita's got it. Right. I mean, you guys like they are selling you a seat on the plane, but they don't focus you on that. They focus you on the emotions on how it will feel when you are finished their service or their product. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, what we ultimately want to invite into the conversation is how will it feel when we are done with our conversation because the vacation, the airline is only the part that is driving you there. 
but that is not ultimately what you want. Like you are buying that, but it is not ultimately the reasons why you are buying that. You are buying it so that you can be at the beach. And how does it feel when you're there? How does it feel when you're in the middle of winter? How does it feel when you're on the beach? They never focus on how does it feel when you're in the process of being on the plane? Because if they focused on that, nobody would ever fly on a plane right? Airline travel for the most part sucks, right? You are like cattle called and like swished in this little tiny seat and you have to sit there for six hours, you know, and you're like, oh my goodness. Like you have some person snoring you, another person drooling beside you. Maybe those two people are like relatives and you're like, oh, this makes it even worse. <laughs> you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to focus on the emotions of where somebody will be. So understand who your client ultimately is, right? Why do they even want to change? right? How will this impact them, right? What pain will they face if they stay where they are? If nothing changes, right? Which is ultimately and oftentimes what the biggest competitor is for us is not what this will look like when it changes, but if nothing changed, what pain would that cause? You know, if you don't take action today, if you stay exactly where you are and in another three months or six months, I ask you, how has life changed? all of a sudden it gets really painful. It might not have been as painful before, but then you realize, well, I haven't, I haven't been like, you know, where I wanted to be by the end of 2019 was I wanted to have a company that was $250,000. I wanted to be feeling like I was financially independent. I wanted to know that I had a company. And, and right now, just none of that has happened, right? I feel like I am working and working and working, right? And I am hopeful that the future will look different, but nothing has changed. And you're like, okay, great. And if something, if nothing continues right now, how will you feel in January and February? And you let them sit with that conversation for a second. Because if nothing changes, nothing changes. And then all of a sudden they start to feel this weight of having three more months, six more months, another year of this anxiety of them not being where they deserve to be. And then we move them to the future state. Okay, and if something changes, right? Or you're now where you need to be, where you deserve to be, right? Now you have a viable company. Now you have more clients than you know what to do with. Now you have considered yourself financially independent. How will that feel? And let them sit with that for a second. Right? You could start off by asking them what that look like first, but then invite the conversation about how that would feel and allow them to embrace that. Right? And how would that change you? And how would that impact you? And what kind of legacy would that allow you to leave? What kind of person would you be contributing to your own family when you are showing up every day like that? and allow them to understand, and who would you become, right? What kind of leader would you be in your local geography? What kind of leader would you become in your country? What kind of person would you be as a family member, right? When you're happy or when you're less stressed, when you now feel that this is exactly the life that you've created. These are very deep questions, and I want you to understand that these aren't exclusive to just a conversation that we have with individuals. We deserve to have these conversations in a business to business setting. Because at the end of the day, behind every business, there's a person. There is somebody there who ultimately has to decide whether to go forward with you or not. And the differences between them deciding whether to choose you versus someone else is how did you make them feel in those conversations? And Maya Angelou said this, one of her most famous quotes, people will always forget what you said. They will always forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And if you are in a situation where you're in competitive and you're trying to compare yourself on a spreadsheet, number one, every single one of my clients and students will lose on a spreadsheet. We will lose on a spreadsheet because all else being equal, everything looks about the same, except we are positioned at this price instead of down here. And the reasons why a client chooses a price up here versus a price down here is because they feel more comforter, comfortable. They feel more secure. They feel that this investment is going to get them so much further on than if they choose the best logical base decision price. Price is logic, right? How we invest is emotional. 
So part of this is going to be to ask better questions. We want to invite better questions throughout the conversation. And these are open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions will start with who, what, where, when, how, or why. And when we prepare for meetings with our clients, we want to make sure that we are preparing the questions to ask our student or sorry, our clients, not what do we need to tell them? What do they need to find out about us? Whereas most of us are conditioned to ask closed-ended questions. Are you, could you, do you, should you, have you, would you, da, 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 da. Are you the decision maker? Would you be ready to make this investment before the end of this year? Um, are you ready to move forward? Do you have any questions? You know, these are very terrible questions because ultimately what they're forcing somebody to answer is a yes or no. Whereas open-ended questions are inviting statements. They are inviting more information. When we are asking yes or no questions, closed-ended questions, we paint ourselves in a corner because we have nowhere to go. We just need them to answer yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then we give them a bunch of information based on this quick response. Whereas when we ask open-ended questions, this becomes much more collaborative. This becomes conversational and it allows and invites the person to understand that we truly understand them. Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And we can better understand the people we are working with when we know who they are and what inspires them, what makes them tick, what makes them want to move to higher levels of success all the way through Margarita says, during a one-on-one -on -one that Kim gave me this advice, I adapted the intro and the, the website hits have more than doubled. Oh, Margarita, that is fantastic to hear. Thank you so much. I am so excited to hear that. Yes, we want to invite this all the way through. The end of the day, any type of sales competition, well, I, I kind of told you guys that introverts make the best salespeople. This is why, because we have two ears and one mouth. So we should always listen twice as often as when we speak. Introverts excel at this because we are better at taking in information. We are better at understanding those around us. So when we can spend our entire meetings with a client, just understanding, asking them questions, getting information all the way through, we better arm ourselves to ultimately know how to help someone. Not think this is how it's going to help you, but know and get them to articulate back to us on how this will impact you. In last month's webinar, Nine Fatal Errors, we talked also about how this impacts the return on investment. Ali had a question about how does this impact the return on investment? Or how do we, how do we get through the pricing conversation with price? Um, this is going to be part of that, is understanding like not just like what does this price make you feel, but when you achieve this level of success, when you are at this beach, how will that make you feel? And what is that worth to you? And how would that impact you? And what would it cost you if you don't make any changes? And getting them to talk about different financial conversations instead of just the price. So we, the, whenever we make any type of decisions, we have to invite emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is a relatively new area of research. And the book Emotional Intelligence was literally written in 1994. So about 25 years ago, right? This is how new in the relative scheme of uh, psychology and social science, how new this area of research is. We know, what we ultimately want to know is like, how connected are we to ourselves and to other people and their emotions. The perfect opposite of this is that for those of you that loved the show, The Office, they had Michael Scott. And Michael Scott, the manager, was probably one of the lowest emotionally intelligent people that possibly was. He was socially awkward. And he would walk in and everyone's like mourning the death of like one of the people's cats, right? Oh, it's so sad. And he would walk in like ready to party. He's like, oh, look at all these people. We should be ready to party. And you're like, Michael, read the room, right? You're, you're not understanding what the emotional state is going into it and yet you're trying to sway it to a different level right first of all you need to understand who you are what the emotions are right how do you check into yourself first and foremost and if you're not doing that take some time to check in and then when you understand what you would feel if I was in this situation, what would I feel to be there? Then we can start to impact the feelings of others. We can use that to become much more socially aware. And using that social awareness, we can ultimately get them to a point where we can actually motivate people to change their emotions um, in a positive way. I don't want you guys to ever think that this is in a manipulative, coercive way. This is, in, this is psychological research, and we do this for the betterment of others. But if, for those 
those of you that score high on social and emotional intelligence, it can actually be better for you than if you were just to score high on IQ. And when they took two different people, two different groups of people, CEOs actually, they tested them on IQ, technical skills, and EQ. And those that scored higher in EQ actually did better for their companies. They created more profitable companies, more revenue generating companies than those that were showing as just singly, right? So what we want to make sure is that we are seeing that person's level of success based on their emotional intelligence. How are you going to tap into high IQ? Because when they did it, I mean, number one, I, to I told you about this, but EQ executives with higher EQ outperformed their targets by 15 to 20%. 20% 20 more. Think about this. And this is just for people that are working in companies. Think about you as business owner, how much more business you can get if you feel more connected to your clients and your clients feel more connected to you. Estee Lauder, a cosmetics company, they took this research and they started to just hire entirely based on emotional intelligence. And what they found was that after a year, those that were hired entirely based on emotional intelligence versus those that were like held on from the original way that they were hiring, those that scored higher ended up outperforming their colleagues by $91,000 more a year in sales. Like if you want to sell more, you need to be more emotionally connected. You need to invite to the conversation all the way through this. And Malcolm Gladwell wrote all about this as well in his book, Blink. 95% of purchases will take place in the subconscious. When Malcolm Gladwell was doing his own research, he started to ask people, if you had, if right now, as you're feeling, which decision would you feel is the right decision for you? And people would say it, and then they would go through their entire decision-making process ultimately they come to one of two decisions. Number one, the decision that they felt that they were going to be, was the best decision for them. They ultimately took a long time to get there through logic only to decide that that the original feeling um, decision was the right one for them. Or number two, they ultimately decided on something different only to feel regret that I should have gone with my gut. So I, one of the things I promised you guys was that emotional intelligence is going to help you sell more faster. We want to invite the conversation or at least the question at, at the end of every meeting or by the time we start to really move forward. How do you feel about this relationship for, so far? How do you feel about the conversations we've been having at this point in time? How do you feel about us continuing to work together in a long-term relationship? And yes, it is going to be uncomfortable at first, but it is a skill. And like any skill, it is always uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to pick up a guitar for the first time and try to strum along. It is uncomfortable to sit at a piano and try to play a piece. It is uncomfortable to try to hit a golf ball the first time you do it. And the more you do it and the more you practice it, the better and easier it gets all the way through. So we want to invite people. How does this conversation make you feel? all the way through. Um, Steph asks, how do you feel authenticity relates, relates to uh, emotional intelligence? I believe that they are both connected all the way through. Authenticity and emotional intelligence, because when we are emotionally intelligent, we understand our own self, right? We can appear and show up as that person. If you are not authentic with who you are, you are not genuine with how you, what you're going through, how you feel, it will appear to have a facade in front of it, right? The very lowest level of emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence is actually a pyramid and the lowest level is self-awareness, right? How well do you know yourself? And if you don't know yourself, you cannot move up into the higher levels of emotional intelligence to impact others because people will see through that. So there'll be something that just doesn't feel right about this. So this is why one of the things I say about sales is about open and honest and transparency. Know yourself in order to know others all the way through. Thanks so much for the question, Steph. At the end of the day, people will buy on emotion and then justify with logic. 
And if you're here based in Canada or even in the States right now, the, the biggest way to find us out is actually watching politics, right? And I'm not here to talk about politics, but I am here to watch the way people will make decisions because we will make our decisions. We will choose the party. We will choose the candidates based on how we feel about that person or how other people make us feel, right? I don't want to go with them. They scare me. They don't, they don't feel right. I want to go with them. They make me feel better. I feel comfortable. I feel optimistic with this party, this candidate all the way through. And then we will read the news headlines. We will read all the information that will justify that decision, right? We will see that the person that makes us most scared, the one that we don't like, the one that gives us like the, Ugh, you know, I'm just, I'm angry with some of the things that they're doing or saying or anything else like that. We will read the headlines that justify that. And we will read the headlines of the person that we want to see in power. And we will justify that all the way through. We do this with all sorts of different purchasing. Everything from the, like, right from the moment that you buy your first house, everyone tells you, you know your house because it'll just feel like home, right? That's what they tell you is to feel, right? What does your gut say? What does it feel? And if you are uncomfortable asking your clients how they feel, start by asking them, what does their gut say? If you had to make this decision today, customer, what does your gut tell you is the right decision? Allow them to tell you where their emotional state is and then justify it all the way through. And if their gut says, well, you know, right now, um, what my gut says is that we're, we're probably leaning towards this other character. We're probably leaning towards this other company. Great, right? You have one of two options. You can either continue to pursue and push or you could say, you know what? I agree, right? Let's just cut our losses. Let's move on. But when we invite the emotional conversation, this is where I'm feeling right now. It's either empowering to know that we're on the right path or it feels negative. This also will work in the negotiation standpoint when we eventually get to the negotiation stage and you ask your client, do you feel that this relationship is something we want to continue on? Do you, how do you feel about us working together in whatever capacity it is? I feel good about that. Great. It takes the pressure off because we know that we want to be connected first and foremost. And then the pricing and the structure and the deal of all the details. But we've agreed that this is something we want to work on. So part of self-management is to understand how are you going to feel when you're walking into different deals? How do you feel walking into different types of clients? And if it's a $10,000 deal or a $100,000 deal or whatever your standard deal size is, times up by 10. What would be the feeling difference for you? And I want, I want to see you guys put this in the chat here, right? What emotions might you feel if it was a $10,000 deal or a $100,000 deal or whatever the size is in difference? If you were working on a deal that was 10 times more than what your average or what you expect your deal to be, what are some of the emotions that you may go through? And I will see all sorts of different people go through everything from excitement and like, you know, anticipation to fear and self-doubt. They will, they will try to rush through it because they're like, well, you know, they're, they're not serious about it, right? They will, they, I will feel that the person doesn't actually want to go through this. And then on the positive side, they'll say, oh, you know, I'm so excited and, you know, and I can't wait and I can't wait and we're trying to rush through it. But this isn't what this is about. We need to remember to slow down. Remember, anytime we talk about emotions, right? Emotions will move us high and, up and down, right? And entrepreneurs and business owners, we know this better than anyone else, right? Salespeople, high-end salespeople know this, right? We live on the roller coaster. When the highs are high, they're really good. And when the lows are low, they're super good. The goal is to help bring us back to equanimity, right? To enjoy the moments what we celebrate but bring ourselves back to neutral status, to know that the lows will not be there for very long and bring us back to neutral status. And remember to put the buyer in the position of power and to allow them and ask them where they are so we can help to slow down, understand what am I going through? What am I feeling through this? Check in every moment that you have. And at the end of it, every interaction should be a joy. If you are not dealing with clients, you're not dealing with vendors, you are not in relationships in your business, in your life that do not leave you feeling more than every single time, right? We should always be leaving our clients feeling more than we should leave ourselves feeling more every day we should leave and we should be like, that was a really good day. Right? That was a really good meeting. I enjoy talking to that person. I had such a great conversation. I felt joyful after that, you know you're on the right path. 
If you are having business conversations that do not leave you feeling excited, feeling optimistic, feeling compassion for what you are creating with this person, then you are in the wrong conversations. And it takes you back to one of the beginning slides. You are not dealing with your ideal clients all the way through. Can we all agree with this? Like, give me like a, a hell yes. Kim. Yes, every conversation I have with my clients, every deal I work on should be joyful all the way through. Maybe I bored you guys. I'm like, I'm starting to get quiet chats here all the time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, 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 absolutely. Thank you guys. I appreciate this because this is exactly where we need to be. So one of the questions we do ask in KO Sales U is would your client be willing to pay for the experience you create with them? I mean, here's the thing you guys is that I know that you had other options to do in this hour that you're spending with me. I know that there was other things that you could have been doing. You could have been making your own phone calls. You could have been answering your emails. You could have been doing all sorts of different things. And yet you chose to spend this time with me. Right. And hopefully you would have been like saying like, this is so valuable, Kim, I would have paid you for it. But I want you to know that you already have, you already have because the time is the one resource that none of us have more of. And by telling me that I would much rather spend an hour learning from you than anything else I could have been doing that the hour I am with you, Kim is most valuable to me. That was the most valuable thing I could have been doing in that time. So number one, I want you to tell, let you know that I feel honored and I feel grateful for this experience. So thank you so much for that. But number two, I want to make sure that you are entering into every interaction, having your clients feel the same way as I feel about you gracing me with your time. When your clients get to spend time with you, I want them to feel better. I want them to feel uplifted. I want them to feel like the time that they've paid was well worth it, was more worth it than anything else that we can do. Oh, well, you're absolutely welcome, Natalie. So remember though, that this is the first day of the rest of your life. Your prospect is going on this journey with you. And whether we're talking about meeting number one, or we're finally at the proposal meeting, or we're closing the deal, they want to continue this journey. Your client has only agreed to go to the proposal stage because they have enjoyed everything that they have done every step along the way. And when you get to the proposal stage and finally asking them for the business, show them that you care, right? This is the most critical moment for you. And yet I see so many business owners, so many salespeople that will just go ahead and dismiss it. I will send you some price. I will send you the email. That's a terrible place to be because when you just send that information, it says, listen, I really want you to be my client, but I don't care enough to go through this final step with you be between where you're my prospect and when you're my client, right? This is the moment that you should be spending the most amount of time on, not anything else. And this is the moment that we need to be embracing each other even further. So I want to tell you really quickly about Steve, because Steve is an engineer. He took our program over a year ago, actually a year and a half ago. I actually got a chance to run into him about three months ago. And he says, Kim, your program changed my life. He goes, we are doing better than I could have ever anticipated us ever do. So Steve specialized in doing engineering, civil engineering services, specifically for indigenous communities. That was the people that he wanted to work with the most. He felt most connected to them. He felt optimistic when he could create amazing things with them and for their communities. And one of the things that Steve told me was that he's like, I'm an engineer. He's like, engineers don't have feelings, Kim. Like, let's be very clear, right? We're, we're engineers. We only think about logical based things. Okay, fair enough, Steve. But we invited him to try something new. Try this conversation. I said, I want you to start by asking people, how would, you, how would that make you feel? When you have described what the, the project is, ask them how that would make them feel. And then take it even a step further and ask them what kind of leader do they want to become? Really understand the goals and the aspirations of the people that you're working with, the clients that are going to choose to work with you. And with those two simple questions, he immediately started to impact his revenue. He actually quadrupled the size of some of the deals that he was in the process of working on. And he says, because of these questions that ultimately moved these sales cycles even faster, because when he, when, P, when the P clients he was talking to them told him what types of leaders 
they wanted to become, what kind of legacy they wanted to leave. It ultimately changed his entire life. So I want to ask you, how, when you change these conversations, when you start to ask these deeper uh, conversations, how would this impact your sales? How could you see this ultimately impact? Now let me know in the chat if you have that. But become better, better pro prospect focused instead of problem focused. We want to uncover the fears and keep addressing that fear. So Anita took our program. She said that throughout it, she found that she was improving her life with every meeting and role play. We do make our students go through role play because we want you to practice it. We want you to impact the conversations that you're having all the way through. Cameron, also an engineer, when he started to invite the conversations about how does this feel? How do you feel about these conversations? How do you feel about what we've created? He came back to me and told me it was like magic. Like magic, he started to impact his deals so much greater than ever before. So for some of you, you're, what you're ultimately asking yourself is, I love the way Kim has approached this, and I want to work with her on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I would love to give you the opportunity. Because I, when I do work with people, I want to make sure that, number one, we are creating something special and amazing. You have to be in a position where you're scaling your company, you're hiring employees, and for three months, you and I will work together one-on-one. -on -one. It is $12,000 to work with me, and we are going to get you there. But right now, you're likely thinking, I would love that. If only there was something that I could do today to get me before that point. If only there was a way I could invite the sales process to create that. We have KO Sales U, which is my stamp of approval. And for those of you that are lucky enough to register for the October 31st class, I will be the instructor for that class size. You will have 10 weekly 90 minute online classrooms with uh, optional Q&A. We do limit the class sizes to eight people. Eight people in order to have plenty of one-on-one -on -one time. You get lifetime access to all your videos, resources, and ongoing material and risk free you guys because we guarantee the results and we are the only program guaranteed results out there that as far as i know and that means that when you do the work if you don't see this change you've done everything and you're not seeing the impact number one everything that you got for for that twelve thousand dollars you now get free of charge i will work with you for that three months now on my own dime with my own time to ensure that you get there. And if for whatever reason you can't, we triple your money back. Right. Doug McKay, who hesitated before he took the program, he's, he did the work and he built his business. And what he found was by the end of it, they were able to finalize a six figure deal more than he could have ever anticipated. And because he had spent so much time with his client creating, they ended up coming back to him and saying, Doug, would you also do this additional piece and we'll pay you more for that? He says they countered him by paying more as a bonus. Imagine how much your life would change when you now have clients that were paying you more than you could have ever anticipated. Nabil, in the sixth week of the course, he said, I really feel like you underpriced the course for the value you gave us. He goes, had I known that this, this piece alone was going to transform my business, I would have done it sooner. All right, you guys, here's your last two opportunities. And, I, and if you are ready, we will have uh, opportunities as well. But your next class will start on October 31st. We have five spots left, so in two weeks. Two weeks time, we'll get started. We don't launch a class because we launch the classes every end of the month. We are not gonna launch a class in November or December. They just don't make sense for us. So your, your next class won't be for a few more months until January. The question you have to ask yourself is when do I want to see this result happen? Not when do I want to start, but when do I want to see this? Do I want 2020 to be the best year it ever could be? Or am I ready to wait until the end of Q1 of 2020? And I'm glad you enjoyed this. Please let me know in the chats what you enjoyed, what you, what you want to see for future webinars. We do these every single month. Our next one will be on November 4th. 
but I want to give you the very best information. I'm not here. Yes, I want to tell you a little bit about KO Sales U because I'm proud of it. But number two, I want to give you all this information because I believe that you can have everything you want in life when you help enough people get what they want. If you want to connect with me further, I'm giving you an opportunity to book a meeting directly with me. Go to kimorleski.com slash meetings slash kim18. You can book a 20-minute sales strategy session with me, and we will go through your business. We will find out more about everything. Um, awesome. I'm there. Yes, Sergey's in the class. So, yes, you will join Sergey as well as uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, Greg as well. Steph, thank you. Oh, Jocelyn, I appreciate. Yes, Jocelyn, thank you. Um, you're welcome, you guys. I am so grateful that you could spend that time with me. The last thing we do is we end every class with the same question we ask in KO Sales U is what will you do today that will have an impact on your business? You can somehow read behind me. It says application does not equal education. Go, go and do it. It is a short week for those of you in Canada. Go and impact your business. Have a significant impact. Go do something all the way through. Neil, oh, you're so nice. He did both. He did KO Sales U as well as work with you and it was the best investment. Thank you, Neil. I very much appreciate it. You guys, that is it. Thank you so much. I'm going to hang on for uh, one more minute in case anyone has any questions or comments. I hope to see you all on November 4th. Goodbye. Yes. Thank you, Margarita. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. If anyone has any quick questions, I will be, um, I'm going to keep the chat open here for a second. Um, yes, Tamara, do I have your ebook? Yes. Um, if you go to, I think the, the quickest one is uh, uh, Kim Orletsky.com slash, I think this, um, this one is still open. Um, that will actually give you a, uh, somewhere in there, right? It's the only one I can think of right now. Um, that one will actually have an access to download the ebook. For free. So, so just check around there. If you can't see it, um, just send me an email. Um, and my email address is Kim at KimMoraleski.com and we'll get you the, um, the link. You're welcome. Yeah. Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.